My name is Markus Wienand. Today I will talk about modern SQL. And by modern SQL, I basically mean everything that happened after SQL 92, which is still the one, the, the standard release most people use and uh, most books care about. But I think there are so many interesting features in the more recent SQL standard releases, and many of them already supported in Postgres. And I just want to raise the awareness of these features <coughs> that they are there, that uh, you can use them. So first of all, who is still using Windows 3.1? <laughs> no one. Uh, there's always one claiming. Who is still remembering Windows 3.1? Okay, that's not everybody. Okay, you have to be aware of that. That's uh, more than 20 years ago. 92 is, is quite a long time ago. Um, and the question I have here in the slides is, is actually real. I mean, uh, nobody uses Windows 3.1 anymore, but everybody um, <coughs> kind of focuses on, on or limits itself to the subset of SQL 92. And that somehow doesn't make sense to me. So here today I will um, uh, introduce a few selected features of a out of a few selected um, standard releases of the SQL standard. So the first one uh, we're going to talk about is SQL 99. That was indeed the big bang in the SQL world because it, it really broke with the relational model. Really, SQL 99 s introduced non-relational features like nested tables and, and uh, it, then, uh, the non-first normal form kind of thing. It really broke with the pure relational algebra and all of that. And the first feature I want to show you is lateral. So what's lateral? Who has ever used that? Okay, quite a few. It's a recent addition in Postgres, but we will see. Um, before I show you um, what you can do with it, I would like to show you what kind of problem it, it, it solves, how we wrote um, statements before we had that feature. And what you see here is an uh, inline view. And for inline views, it is forbidden to refer <laughs> to the outside part of the query. So that reference, which I have here from the T1, inside that inline view is illegal. That doesn't work in SQL 92. We have to put that join criteria in the on clause or using clause or whatever you like. That's the way SQL 92 works. And now we can add the modifier lateral and wow, it's allowed now. That's basically what it is about. So this reference is now okay, that's fine. Um, we still need to, to satisfy the, the syntax of the join. Yes. That will come in a later slide. So the question what version um, will be covered in a later slide. Um, the lateral is really just a modifier for the join. That means um, if we have an inner join like here, we still need an on clause. And if it's uh, quite useless in that case, we just put in the on true. Um, you, we could also do a cross join in that case, cross join lateral, and then we uh, don't need the on clause anymore. But the big question is, why the heck do we need that? What for? And there are two common use cases. The first one is uh, calling table functions with arguments from previously mentioned um, tables. In that uh, example here, I'm passing the t1.id parameter to a table function, which is joined in. So this is the one use case. Um, the other one is uh, if you want to apply some logic inside the inline view, which you could not apply otherwise. And the most prominent example here is limiting the data set. So in that particular case, what that query does, it selects from categories, so all the categories. And for each category, it's going to the products table, ordering them by some ranking, whatever that might be, and then limiting, limiting it to three rows. So that's basically selecting the top three rows per category. And that's something we could not do without lateral in that way, because um, then the semantics of the limit would apply globally and not limited to one category. So this is the second use case. Um, there is another, another way to use that. This is for what I call the multi source top end query. It's like thinking in Twitter or whatever social network you like. Show me the latest 10 news out of my network. So I have many subscriptions, and I want to have the 10 latest overall. 
So this might be a query to do that. It's basically just joining subscriptions by news, filtering from my user, then ordering by date descending and limiting to, let's say, 10. And if I'm out of luck, Postgres might end up with a query plan like that. And to make it a little bit more visible, it first joins basically all the news which I have subscri I'm subscribed to, which happens to be 900,000 rows in that case. And then it's doing the top end sort and filtering out the 10 most recent ones. So, yeah, maybe not the best thing to do. So why do we produce 900,000 rows, basically all the news I have ever been interested in? Uh, if we have only 80 subscriptions in that case, we can see that in the execution plan. And I'm only interested in ten, the 10 most recent news. So the answer is it should be enough to search for 10, the 10 most recent news for each subscription and then again sort that, that 800 rows and, and filter them to 10 rows. And this is what we can do with lateral. We can just write this top end query for the 10 most recent rows inside the inline view. Um, so kind of limiting that result to 800, 80 by 10, number of subscriptions by number of rows. And then in the end, we have to sort and, and limit again to get just the 10 very most recent ones. If we look at the execution plan, it does what we would expect to in that case. It goes to each and every subscription, fetches the 10 most recent rows, and then just sorts them again and throws away what we don't like, provided you have the right index there. So here we have this limit to 800. That's the number of subscriptions by the number of lines. So that's the upper limit for this kind of query. This 100,000 times is just a ballpark figure. It's whatever data you put into your test schema. It works fine. So lateral. I like to compare those recent SQL features to features we know from other programming languages, like the more imperative programming languages. And in that way, I like to compare lateral with for each, because it's executed a, a predefined number of times. Lateral works well with all kind of auto joins, almost all kind, not right, but cross join, auto join is fine, or inner join. It's really just a modifier. It's great for that kind of top N optimizations. That's what I use it most of the time for. And it's also great um, to join table functions. And unnest here is the most frequently used one. Who is using unnest? OK, so that's also a good use case for that. OK, and now coming back to your answer, uh, your, to your question, can you use it yet? Uh, well, I don't know. But if you have Postgres 9.3, then yes. So it's a quite recent addition, but still in there for some while now. Nine three. It's yeah, nine three. Yeah. So maybe I said nine two, who knows? So it is nine three. Whatever the slide says is true. I might be wrong, but the slides are true. So yeah, and as you can see it's uh also appearing in other databases right now, like in Oracle. Um yeah, after some fifteen years in the standard. The next selected feature I want to talk to, to about is um, with. And with has two flavors. This is just a simple case. So it's called <coughs> common table expressions. And first, again, I would like to show you the problem you can solve with that. So if you're having a query like that, which is just scratched here, uh, and you want to make sense out of that because some colleagues dropped it on your table, then you have to pass it a little bit and find the innermost part first then you can make sense out of that. Then you can go one step outside and make sense out of that. Then you might find another subquery on the same level, which is then joined. So you might need to understand <coughs> that also as, as well first, before you can finally make sense out of the very first line. So this is the way um, SQL 92 is written. Yes? And you might need to repeat yourself too, right? It, you might need to repeat yourself too. That, that's also true. So. What I'm coming up for now is this with statement. And with in the simple form is really just a statement scoped view. Think of it like that, statement scoped view. It's not a view you create in a database. No, it's just a view which you put in front of your query 
and it's just visible for that query, statement scoped view. Let's go through the syntax. So there's a new keyword, with. After with, you define the name of the view, which is A in that case, and you optionally define the names for the columns it returns. And after that, you just say S and some definition. Select blah, 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 as we know it from create view. Um, you can then go on. You can write a comma there after that and add another common table expression. In that case, this common table expression can already refer to the previously defined ones. That's just fine. It kind of overlaps with lateral in this case, right? I don't think so. Why do you so, uh, so? Well, because you could access, like if you come back to your first example, you did with lateral access in the previous. Uh, yeah, but the, the lateral is more or less executed per row. And this is, this is just, just a different way to, to write your query. So for the with views, I, I like to, to see as a, just a source code management feature. That there's nothing more to it. So I've also defined a third common table expression here called C. And then finally, the important part is that there is no comma anymore after that definition. And that basically means that the main query coming now, which can then access all of the common table expressions you have defined before. So the big game changer, kind of, at least for me is, you can now read it top down and not innermost outside. It's really source code management. It's also more nice, uh, placed more nicely with uh, um, git and so on for the diffs. So that's what it basically is. If I compared it to, to other programming languages, I would say it's like private methods. It's something you can define. You can also reuse it within that statement. You can refer to that multiple times. But its visibility is strictly limited to the following statement. Um, technically, and in Postgres factually, with is just a prefix for select. So you can put with everywhere where select could be. That means you can write things like that, insert into, with, and then select. You can also um, use with in subselects, like inline views or whatever. That's all valid. With is really just a prefix for select. And I think Postgres is the only database that implemented it right. But, If you want to use that, there is a <coughs> tiny issue I have to tell you about. Looking at this example, so with common table expression and just selecting everything from the news table. And in the main query, I'm then filtering on some topic ID equals one. And the problem here is that uh, for common table expressions, Postgres does not push down those predicates. That means even if you have an index on this topic, it won't be used. So it's really executing the common table expression independently and then kind of just filtering that afterwards. Yes? Although actually that can be a nice trick when you're query tuning. And yeah, I, I know. There, there is a use case for, for that. It's just, to, uh, I have to make you aware that um, if I'm telling you it's about source code management, then, then you have to be aware that there uh, are some drawbacks. Um, yeah. From the Postgres community, I'm getting uh, the feedback that this was implemented because it's mentioned that way in the standard. I don't know where this is written. If somebody knows where this should be written, I would love to learn about that. Standard does not talk about implementation. That, that's what I'm saying as well. And every other database is, is just inlining it. It's equivalent if you put it in a with or inlined. So, yeah. But there's a use case for it. I don't think so. It's but been discussed. It's it is? Yeah. Oh, it's great, great. It's not, it's not Le let's vote for it. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the, the, I think one of the arguments against uh, doing that is that people have come to use it as an optimization yeah. barrier, and, and um, it, it will break people's optimizations. Yeah. But uh, there's still serious consideration. Yeah. Uh, I would suggest um, to just introduce a new modifier, modified, with uh, materialized, with materialized 
to keep the old one. The, the keyword materialized is already used for materialized views. Yeah. So it's the parallelism. Hmm? Okay. I think that would make sense from my perspective. OK. So here we go. Just to show you, if you inline that with view, then the predicate push down just works fine. So if you would rearrange that query to the with example, then you may badly break performance as of now. OK, just to be aware. OK, so this was something um, which I would more or less consider downside of the Postgres implementation. But here are some upsides. Postgres, unlike the SQL standard, allows uh, inside update delete inside the with clause, whatever that means. So in that example, let's go through that. So with deleted rows, and inside that view, I'm deleting some rows from some source table. And I say, return what I have just re deleted. So with this uh, view, I'm deleting those rows and returning it. And in the main query, I'm just insert into destination from that view. So that's basically moving rows from the source to the destination table. This is quite handy, but it's not SQL standard. It's a Postgres extension. So can you use it yet, this with feature? Yes, probably. So who's still running on 8.4 or later? You're out of life. And oh my god. So migrate. I'm sorry. But if you're on 8.4 exactly, then it still works. So that's fine. So I would like to emphasize that there is only one red bar right now on this slide, OK? Even SQLite can do that, OK? <laughs> OK, coming to the next feature. With, yeah? Um, it just struck me that the use of the delete and the insert, if you allow migration of clauses up into the with clause, that would be really weird. Like, like with select, moving stuff up into the with clause Probably. So I, I can't respond to that right now because I've not thought about that before, because this is a Postgres extension. So, yes. But yes, it needs to be. OK. So uh, the similar thing was done in DB2. It's, uh, uh, really? In this case, it's select, select star from new table or old table. You do the transition tables. Uh -huh. and that's probably what might happen in the standard, because it seems to be agreed upon by Oracle that this is a, a, a better syntax. Anyways, so the way what we did there was that we uh, said that we actually don't want nested uh, uh, modifications because it's, it, it comes a real order problem, right? In which order do you execute? If you have like joints, right? Uh, they could bind each other. You could go for the same table. So we actually use then the with clause as a sorting mechanism where you then actually really get the, the kind of like materialization where you say the first one gets executed first. Once it's done, then the next one comes, right? And this problem that you have with these nested uh, 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 changes is the same thing that you would have. You would have, for example, a table function or a table function that doesn't insert, right? Somewhere in the select right. So you get the same weirdness. So you have to be careful when you move predicates around. So here you have to be aware what happens when you move past these uh, external actions, whatever you want to call them, volatile functions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go on, but we can chat afterwards, I think. So. With recursive, which is um, yeah, well, something quite different. Um, I'd like first again to show you um, how we solved that kind of problem before we had that feature. And you can see it very clearly on the screen. <laughs> so with risk recursive, you can solve a completely new type of, of problems. And it's also part of the game making SQL uh, Turing complete. So what it does allow is um, it's a new modifier with recursive. 
and it allows that the second leg of the inside of the union you have to put inside may refer to itself. So let's go through that. That's the new keyword. Okay, great. Uh, if you use risk recursive, the column name list is mandatory. Great. Then we start with S, and in there you must have a union or union all with two legs. And the first leg is obviously first executed. So in that case, it's just returning one row with one value, which is, happens to be one, which is then kind of sent out to this common table expression. And it appears everywhere where this common table expression is referred to. So that's once in the main query, and because I'm just selecting star from that common, main, uh, common table expression here, it already becomes part of the final result. So then the second leg of the union is uh, executed, and you get that one in there as well. So we are comparing that for the where clause, which is fine. One is uh, less than three. Then we are incrementing it because select n plus one, it's two. And this one is again sent out to this common table expression, and the game repeats. And here you see something which is actually a loop. So we can now program loops in SQL. That goes on until the second leg doesn't produce any rows anymore. And in my case, that is the case when the n less than 3 is not true anymore. And then just the loop terminates. So that's the most simple case of um, recursive common table expression. And this use case is called a row generator because it generates rows. Um, generate series, which we love from Postgres, is um, not standard version. It's just a proprietary extension. The most interesting use case for with recursive is processing graphs. But you have to be careful to prevent uh, killer loops, non-terminating loops. Be careful. Um, and put in the most general way, with recursive allows you to implement loops in native SQL which have dynamic abort conditions, unlike lateral, which is executed for each row. With, um, with recursive, you can uh, phrase a dynamic abort condition. And another interesting feature is that you can pass data from one iteration to the next one, like I have just done it here, a counter. Okay? That's also something you can't do with lateral. So I like to compare with recursive with while loops because it, it actually is. Um, be careful, infinite loops are a thing of reality. Um, and the recursive keyword, although it is in the standard and mandatory in the standard if you want to refer to yourself, um, most databases don't require it. Some databases don't know it, but still accept the self-reference, like SQL Server and Oracle. So can you use it yet? Probably yes. Go ahead. It's there. It works since five years or so. OK? Also in SQLite. OK, so that was my selection of features out of SQL 99. The next one was SQL 2003. And that was another Big Bang. This was the OLAP um, feature set. And you probably know that from that kind of feature. Who knows over? or window functions. OK, great, because that's, that's really an important feature. Together with uh, recursive common table expressions, SQL became uh, Turing complete because of overclauses, accidentally. So again, let's show how we would write a specific query without that feature. But I'm already using SQL 99 features, and to eat my own dog food, I've put in a with clause there, so I can explain it to you up, down. So I'm starting with a few called total salary by department. I like to type a lot. Okay. Then let's look what it is about. So it's from employees. It's grouped by department. And sum of salary. Okay. No surprise. It's total salary by department. Then that, let's look at the main query. So it's going to the employees table and joining that common table expression in by department. So I have the total um, salary for the department next to each uh, employee there. And what I'm doing with that is just calculating how much is this employee earning out of the whole department. That's what I'm doing in salary divided by the total by 100 in percent. So that's a possible way to solve that kind of problem without window functions. But before I show you how window functions work to solve that, I'd like to remind you of something with. 
I really like it to organize source code. In that example, total salary by department. Who likes to type such long identifiers? Uh, only a few. Me neither. But I like to put a mental model in, the, in your head right up front. That's what I really like. That makes it easy to understand. To use it later on, I like a shortcut like TS. That's what I really like. And uh, unlike if you write it with brackets inside there, um, you can actually give it two names that in this uh, with view. You can give it the real view, and then you can alias it once more. OK? Tiny thing, but I like it. Another issue. What if I would do that? So I have added another where clause at the main query. It's, it's your turn. Yeah, it's still Postgres still aggregates for all the for all the employees actually. So that's just what I have to emphasize more than once. Sorry. Um, okay. So why do we need to do it that way? And the truth is that before SQL 2003, there was no way to build aggregates without um, group by. And group by also collapses rows like this thing does. So if you want to have um, an aggregate but don't want to collapse rows, there was just no solution than first building the aggregate and then joining it to the original back again. And with SQL 2003, we now have a solution for that. And this is what the new query looks like. So now it reads, reads salary divided by sum over salary over partition by department. So what does that mean? Let's go through slowly. Simple query. Select department salary from employee. Result. And the first thing you should do when you uh, think about using window functions is pressing the comma button. That's all it about. You are adding another column to the result set. That's what window functions are good for. Then you can choose any aggregate function you like. Sum, min, max, count, name the beast. All the ones you know. And because you don't have a, a group by, you need to define over which rows this aggregate function is to be applied. And that's what we can declare with the over clause. And in the simplest case, over bracket open bracket closed means just over the whole result. So that means over that part, which means you will get another column having the total sum at each row. And that's the difference. It doesn't collapse anything. Okay. So the next step is to put in that partition by, which is quite simple. It just segregates the result set um, like group by does. That's it. So the result you're getting now is that in the first group, you only build the sum over the first group, in the second group over the next two rows, and so on. It's just segregating like group by does. So over in this simple form. You can just use it with all the aggregate functions we already know. With the over clause itself, you define the rows which should be put into the aggregate function. Over empty clause is like group by empty clause, and over partition by is like group by. But it's only the first part of the over clause. The next part is over and order by. On the first side, it might not make uh, sense to, to put order by into context to um, aggregate functions like sum, because it doesn't matter in which way you build the sum. The result is always the same. But there's an interesting feature of order by. First, let's look how we would solve the problem without that feature. And the example I'm having here is a running total. So we have bank transactions um, for a specific account. They are ordered into some, some specific order. And I would like to have the running total next to each transaction. So one way to do it is using a Scala sub subsquery in the where clause, just putting it here, and just building up the sum there, and selecting the rows you want to sum over. So that's basically the same account, and all that rows that happen to be before that row, including itself. So yeah, that's SQL 99. One of the things is, that you have to keep the where clauses and the order clauses in sync. 
which might become tricky if the order by clause is non-trivial, like more columns mixing, uh, mixing ask and desk, then you need to rephrase that order by clause as a where clause in the inner query that's getting messy. So before SQL 2003, running totals, you had either to do a scalar, self, uh, scalar sub query like seen here, or a self join. Um, the maintainability was not great, the performance was even worse. So in all honesty, the only real answer, and in quite many cases it's still the best answer, was just do it in the application, really. <coughs> SQL was just not the be best choice for that kind of problem. But nowadays, we have over and order by. And the funny thing is, although it doesn't make any difference in which order you um, summarize the, the transactions, once you have put this result into a specific uh, order, you can narrow the window of rows which is to be feed into the aggregate function. <coughs> so read this, order by transaction ID, and then there's a modifier. Rows between unbounded preceding and current row. So that's the window of, of rows that will be fed into the sum uh, function. So it's getting um, more and more rows the further it proceeds. Okay. Besides defining a, a frame like the, the, the standard clause, so narrowing the window of, of rows to be aggregated, um, once you have an order defined, another type of functions make sense, like row number, which was also introduced with SQL 2003, but more importantly, rank dense rank, ranking functions, like um, questioning how do we cope with ex equo um, placements in sports, like first and first place. And who's coming next? Is it then the third place or the second place? That's the difference between rank and dense rank. So that's basically what you can do with over and order by. Can you use it yet? Yes, of course. OK, then I'd like to skip over to SQL 2008. I must tell that I have skipped one. 2006, there was also a standard release. Uh, I just don't like that one so much. So I'm skipping it here today. Uh, one, slide back. one slide back. How can DB2 have that feature in 99 when it's 2003? <laughs> they, yeah. So they implemented it and pushed it into the standard afterwards. Cool. And I think the, o the over clause was actually invented, invented by, by I Oracle. Also like my, yeah. Run my own standards. yeah. <laughs> we will see that once more again. Yeah. Okay, SQL 2008. And surprise, surprise, they added something more to over in SQL 2008. So the example I'm showing you now is the difference. It's not the running total. It's I do have the totals, let's say, per day, but I would like to see the difference to the previous day. How would that be done in SQL before 2008? One way to do it, and I'm all, again using all the features which were introduced with 2003 or earlier, is that you just number the, the rows. So I have a common table expression here, which basically selects all the data and putting another column in there, which is just numbering the rows using the window function row number. And then I'm self-joining that common table expression to itself, and I'm offsetting in the on clause the rows by one. Okay? And then have the current and the previous next to each other, and I can build a difference. That's one way to do it before SQL 2008. There are many other ways. You can also so solve it with SQL 92, but it's not fun. Nowadays, with SQL 2008, the query looks like that. So we can just say lag, which is a new window function, um, give me the previous value of the column balance according to the order by clause mentioned in the over clause. That's it. Same result. Okay? But quite more easy. Um, besides lag, we have also got some other functions like lead, obviously in, in the other direction. We have first value, we have last value, we have nth value. And nth value has also modifiers like from first, from last, and respect nulls, ignore nulls, which are not supported by Postgres yet. Don't know, is there any progress going to be there? Probably not. They can be emulated, it's just, you know, it's handy to have them. Yeah, it, we, we recognize that that isn't there yet, and 
was just wasn't something we could get in the initial release. It'll probably get mm. done someday, but I don't know of any specific plans yeah. there. Yeah, it's not a real showstopper. I, I hardly ever need it, but it's handy if you need it. But it can be emulated quite easily by nesting it once more. So. OK, so can you use it yet? Yes, because it was also introduced <coughs> to Postgres five years ago with 8.4. OK? The next feature which was introduced with SQL 2008 is one which I like very, very much. It's called Fetch First. Who has ever used that? OK, some smiling faces. <laughs> OK, what is it about? I have used limit already in these slides, but I did not mention that limit is not SQL standard. So what does fetch first do? It's basically like limit, but SQL standard. If you don't want to use limit, if you want to stick to the standard, one way to, to do it is actually using the row number window function. That's a pretty good way to use except in Postgres, which does not optimize this properly because it doesn't realize it's an ever-growing number and aborting once it has fetched 10 rows, like uh, Oracle and SQL Server, and I think also DB2 do. But that one will run over the full result, numbering all of them, and then filtering all the other ones away. So yes, that's SQL standard conformant, but don't do it in Postgres. So yeah, well, let's use a non-standard feature like limit. That, that's the right answer here. But now we have a standard feature for that. It's called fetch first 10 rows only. So there are other people who like to type a lot. And on the next slide, you can see who, uh, at which company these other people are working. So yeah, it's, it's the same question again. So it is an SQL 2008 feature, but DB2 already had it in uh, yeah, 2000. So guess who, who invented it? Can you use it yet? Yes, also in Postgres. You can already use that. It's old stuff. It's just... Um, cross-platform benefits. OK, again, this was just a selection out of SQL 2008. And now, finally, I would like to come to the most recent release of the standard. Yeah? Can we go, go back one slide? Yes. So the question, can, can we go back one slide? Yes, I can. Wait another slide. It's coming. It's coming. OK, I can go ahead. So SQL 2011, the most recent release of the standard. And the killer feature of SQL 2011 is temporal and bitemporal databases. So who has ever used that? Who has ever missed that? Who has no clue what I'm talking about? <laughs> ah, OK. I will show you what temporal and bitemporal databases is about. But before that, It's written there. It's not in this talk, but it's written there. Um, so with SQL 2008, they introduced a standard conformant way to implement limit. But they didn't put offset in, which is great, until SQL 2011, when they did. So offset. Who knows offset? OK, I don't need to explain it. Who uses offset? I don't like offset because of so many reasons. So the problem it solves is, yeah, you know it. The way it is uh, to be written is, yes, you can do it that way, but you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Remember? Pardon? Just like the, like the URL. Yeah. With faster. OK. 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 Um, the reason I don't like offset too much is, uh, I'll explain it that way. I like to compare SQL features to the functions of functionality of, of other programming languages. You remember? Lateral for each, rec with recursive while and so on. Offset, I like to compare to sleep. <laughs> the bigger the number, the slower the execution. So that's, that's the only good use case for offset. The problem with offset is that it it's not only slow. I, I don't mind about slowness. I mean, it's better than sleep. It does just not wait. And it, it even uh, kills resources for you. I mean, it, it needs CPU and all of that. But 
point, giving that point away. Offset, you have to keep in mind that offset is renumbering the rows all the time. So if your table moving behind the scene, if you're inserting, it's renumbering again. So it's probably not delivering the result you, you're up for. So it's not the answer to pagination queries. Okay, keep that in mind. Offset gives you the wrong results. And besides that, it's ultra slow. Great. So use it. Or grab a place near to the exit there and there. <laughs> coasters. Okay? There is the no offset coaster. There are also stickers for no offset, okay? And a lot of other stuff. And there is a URL written, written there. It's that one. And this one explains how to do it right without offset. Getting the right result faster. Okay? There's also a presentation online on that URL. But just keep in mind, offset is actually a no-go. Don't use it. Okay? So can you use it yet? <laughs> you could. And yeah, well, this is the only slide in this presentation where MySQL turns green. <laughs> And we can again use that slide to make our conclusion who invented that feature. <laughs> and we see the version number 3.20.3 of MySQL, which happened to be in 89 or so. And the re release note said, um, with this, it is easy to do a poor man's next page, previous page, www application. Yeah, poor man. So that's what we have now. And it's, it's really, it's bad. Don't use it just because it's standard doesn't make it good. Yes. There is one legitimate use, offset zero. Oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. So there's one good use, offset zero. Yeah, it's like, yeah, maybe it like sleep zero. It creates an optimization barrier for a subquery. OK, so it creates an optimization barrier. L like with? Is it? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, it's, it's the alternative. The Postgres, we, we like to say we don't have hints but yeah. we have these optimization yeah. barriers you can introduce that basically accomplish more or less the same thing. And one of them is <coughs> offset zero. You put that in a subquery, and you can't optimize it into anything else. OK. So th there is a, a side effect in Postgres which can be exploited for good use. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Um, other than that, so only use offset zero and not offset any, any other number. So, but coming back to SQL, I'm going over time. Is this a problem for you? OK. Um, other than, than offset, SQL 2011 is about temporal and bitemporal databases. And the problem it solves is a problem you all, everybody of you had. And it is a problem introduced by normalization. OK? Because normalization, we say, if we have many orders for the same client, we store the client only once. But normalization doesn't really answer what to do when the the client data, the master data, changes. And who has ever invented some kind of tracking, history tracking table for that? Huh? Who did? Yeah, some of you. And now we have built-in language support for that kind of problem. Again, just a selection out of the features. First one, as of. I've selected as of because it will be in SQL Server 2016. It was just announced uh, months ago. And on Reddit, they are like, woo, 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 woo. So I thought I'll show it up here. So before SQL 2011, changing data was destructive. You have deleted it, it's gone. If you want to have a soft delete, you have to implement it on your own. OK. SQL 2011 allows us to declare on table level that we would like the database engine to keep track for us on changes of this table. So I've shown you here a create table statement. What you need for that, according to the standard, is two columns, which represent the, the timestamp when the column this column version started to exist and when it ended to exist. And you have to tell the database that it has to be maintained by the database itself by saying, generated always as row start or row end. Other than that, these are pretty ordinary columns. You can also use other uh, data types here. You, you could technically use date if you like. Not a good idea, but you could. Then you define a period which combines the start timestamp and tom end timestamp kind of in a TS range kind of thing. And finally, you say with system versioning. 
And that's the magic. Now this table is a system version table, which means it behaves like that. If you're going to insert something, you don't need to mention, you are not allowed to mention those two meta columns, the start timestamp and timestamp. They are maintained by the system. So if you insert them, they will be populated automatically. It's just there. So that row was inserted at 10 o'clock. If you then update it, um, yeah, well, then it looks like that. You will end up with two row versions there. It's not destructive anymore. Okay? There's only one current one, but the old one is still there. And obviously, if you delete it, it means just the timestamp is, is changed. So you have now multiple versions of that same row in the living in the database, but it's transparent. You, you just update it and you get one more row. And even if you select it, it's still transparent. You just see the current row. Can you delete the mark the no, because it's, yeah, well, by, by changing the times, time of the database. <laughs> but you, 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 you're, you're not allowed to update those um, things directly. They are system versions. There's also the application version. That's the reason why it's called bitemporal databases. You can have a, a second time access on these tables as well. I don't have it in the slides, but you can also use it for application um, timestamps, and then you, can, then you have to maintain them on your own. But this is system version um, tables. Uh, yeah, and it's transparent, even for the select. So if you select after 12 o'clock, after it was deleted, you won't see anything anymore. Transparent. Unless you want to see something old, where you just say, from T, and then you have the new modifier, for system time as of, and that timestamp. And then you will see that information at that timestamp. It's a modifier to the from clause. So that's system version table. That's the temporal aspect. And the bitemporal is then also uh, application version. Can you use it yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 no way. So technically, it is in DB2, and it seems to be correct. Um, technically, it is in, in Oracle, but not in the same syntax, because Oracle introduced it years ago, uh, called it flashback queries. So it's there for a long time, but it has a different syntax. And yeah, f it was announced for SQL Server 2016 um, about a month ago. The last few days, there was the, the release candidate, so you can already download SQL Server 2016, and people are starting to, to play with this feature. So that, that's hot right now. So that's just the reason I have put it into the slides here as well. <coughs> the next can you define your retention period? Not according to the standard. Not, not, that, that's great. not that I would remember... Not that I would remember how it is done. <coughs> so yeah, I would need to look how how Oracle does it, but so you would be able to do like delete as of um, when all the entries or not? I guess you should. It's a good question. Uh, it's a good question which I don't have an answer for. Just in that definition, there without a retention period, this is an ever-growing table. <coughs> yes. But it's, it's mostly useful for, for slowly changing the things. The standard typically is weak on EDL. So the standard really only cares for how applications use it. That's why you mm -hmm. wouldn't even find a create index statement in the standard. Yeah. So this is up to the vendor. I, I, I think it will be in the document. I, I, I don't know. So I think the standard, uh, I don't even think it's, I, I know if there's a standard way to actually delete it brutally. But I've never thought about that. It's not yet a problem, just in 10 years. <laughs> okay. <coughs> the second feature, <coughs> and again, this is just a selection um, of SQL 2011, is without overlaps. Because as you have seen, we have now multiple versions of the same row in the database at the same time. So eh, how do we cope with uniqueness and primary constraints in that case? And the answer is without overlaps constraints. So with SQL 2011, uh, if we want to prevent things like that, having overlapping time periods specified, doesn't need to be a system version table. It can be arbitrary um, time frames. Um, there was previously no way to, to make uh, 
a, declar a declaration to prevent that. You had to create a trigger or whatever, no nice solution. Now we can write a primary key that refers to a, a period which we have just defined in the table and saying without overlaps. And um, as lucky as we are, we can kind of use that already in Postgres. It's not the same syntax. It doesn't, it's not a keyword without overlaps. But starting with 9.2, we have exclusive constraints. Who has ever used them? OK. And uh, range types. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, combine those two. And then you can write an exclusive constraint like shown here, where I just say the ID is to be compared with the equal sign. And the period is to uh, compared with the double Abason, the, the overlaps operator, and make sure there are no two um, confirming to them. So it's different syntax, but same functionality. It's just a declaration. It's not a runtime code like a trigger or so. OK, selection out of SQL 2011. Really, 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 really go to this link. I will tweet it in maybe half an hour or so. Go there. Read this paper. It's good. It's 10 pages, and it's, it's really an awesome uh, explanation how these features and also the, the other features, which I haven't mentioned, um, will work or are work, uh, working according to SQL 2011. So without overlaps, can you use it yet? Um, yeah, well, in Postgres, kind of. Different syntax, same functionality. So this is the point where I have been told that the end of my talk is pretty abrupt. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, <laughs> do you have any questions? Yes. Um, and maybe this is a naive question, but why are they timestamps and not timestamp TZ? You can. Okay. You can. You can do whatever you need, because the reason bec the reason for short short is just slide space on the slide is you know making it big enough so everybody can read. You can use any type there you like. It needs to be a temporal type. I, I, think, I think time alone is also not good, but date would be technically OK. okay. But I don't think it makes sense. I think you will end up with some, some timestamp. And as it is a system version table, I'm not even sure if you need timestamps there. Well, why not date? If you say just yeah, then you can have only one version per day. More than once a day. Yeah, well, if, if this is your use case, then yeah, great. Go ahead. Okay. This example deliberately simple for the sake of the talk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, thank you. If you have any more questions, I'm outside. Um, don't forget to grab the stuff down there and don't ever use offset again. Okay? Thank you.